Hi guys, today we're going to be going over glacial depositional environments, but this is only part one of a two-part glacial depositional environments video because this time we're going to be talking about glacioterrestrial processes and deposition, and next time we'll talk about glacial lacustre and glacial marine processes. So what are glaciers? First of all, glaciers are slow-moving masses of ice, so not very complex there, just simple as can be. And what you can do to make this lecture easier to visualize for you is think of glaciers as rivers of ice. And this is because what happens is a lot of times with valley glaciers, for example, you'll have them flowing down a valley and picking up and carrying and transporting sediment just like a river would. However, it happens really slowly and the landforms and deposition characteristics that glaciers cause are very characteristic of glacial processes, whereas rivers are a bit different. So that's where the analogy tends to to break apart, which is nice because then we can tell the difference in the rock record, whether something is glacial or fluvial. So anyway, as an introduction, glaciers are slow moving masses of ice that flow downhill, erode sediment and transport it. But before we get into deposition and stratigraphy, we have to talk a little bit about how glaciers form. First, a large amount of snow must accumulate and those snowflakes that come down as snow are very soft and not very compact. So once they start to accumulate, they start to get compacted and they turn into a more compressed, denser type of crystalline material called fern. And then this fern over time gets compressed more and more and partially melted and recrystallized enough times to where it turns into a congealed mass of glacier ice. And this glacier ice or this huge mass of ice is what then does the flowing and the deposition transport, etc. And this formation of glaciers can take hundreds of years. So it's a slow process. And what we can see in this image in this figure to the top left is something called the zone of accumulation and the zone of wastage. And what we see with these two zones is basically that there's one zone where snow is accumulating and eventually getting compacted and forming into glacial ice, whereas there's another zone where there is more melting than accumulation, and that's called the wastage zone, where ice is lost, not gained. And wind glaciers have more more accumulation than wastage, they will advance, and when they have more wastage than accumulation or more melting than accumulation, they will retreat. And the equilibrium line, as we can see in this figure as well, is what separates the two zones, and it's also called the snow line. Also, something to keep in mind that's important is glaciers do not flow uphill. They only appear to flow uphill sometimes when they're in retreat. They advance downhill and they retreat whichever way they came from as they melt, but it's not that they're moving that direction. So before we get to the nitty-gritty geology stuff, like I promised, first we gotta talk about a little bit of classification of different glacier types. First, we have continental ice caps and ice sheets, which are the largest type of glacier on the planet. Examples of this are in the Antarctic ice sheet or the Greenland ice cap, and these look a little bit like this picture shown here, and they are super expansive, as we all know from looking at <laughs> Antarctica and Greenland. So moving on to valley glaciers, we already mentioned these once when we were talking about what they are and how they flow. So now, as we can see in this picture, these are <laughs> glaciers that flow in a valley, and an example of this is shown in this picture, which is the same picture I used for the title slide of this lecture. Valley glaciers are some of the most beautiful things Things you'll ever see. Unfortunately, I live in Texas, so I don't see many, but the pictures are beautiful. And we'll talk about some of the erosional and depositional processes that these glaciers can cause a little bit later in the lecture. Next, we have outlet glaciers. Outlet glaciers represent glaciers that flow out of an ice cap or ice sheet as valley glaciers, kind of like the one seen in this picture we have here, where we have this valley glacier that acts as an outlet for ice in the ice sheet on top of that continent. And then we have have Piedmont glaciers which form a fan-like structure once they reach a flat lowland area and these are some of the most beautiful structures in my opinion as shown here in this picture and you can find many many pictures of beautiful Piedmont glaciers out there and so you can tell the kind of fan morphology they have similar to alluvial fans, submarine fans, any kind of flow that flows down into an open lowland area. We've talked about other depositional environments where fan morphology is common 
common. And this is the same case in glaciers. It just happens a lot slower. And finally, we have tidewater glaciers. And as we see here, I've circled iceberg, and this is because these have to do with tidewater glaciers. This is because tidewater glaciers, such as the one shown in the picture, meet up directly with seawater. And then because of that, they break up from time to time with huge masses of ice breaking off this glacier and then floating in the water as icebergs. And when these icebergs break off their glacier, this is called calving. So now that we have the basic types of glaciers laid out, let's get into some of the glacial processes that cause unique geologic deposition. So first we'll talk about how ice flows. We mentioned a little bit of how it flows downhill, but what's the mechanism there? When you think about it, ice is actually a mineral and glaciers are like rocks full of the ice mineral. And when you think about it, rock doesn't tend to flow. If you're gonna go outside and look at a rock right now or a mountain, do you see it really moving much? No, no, you don't. So what happens actually is that the glacial ice doesn't really flow on its own. What helps it along is water at its base. Because ice can melt and form water in doing so, that can help lubricate the base of the glacier and help it flow downhill and erode and deposit as it does so. However, there are specific ways in which ice deforms itself as it moves. As the glacial ice moves and deforms, it causes ice crystals to slip along cleavage planes. Yes, just like minerals like mica, ice has cleavage planes. And when it slips along these planes, it can either fold in plastic deformation or fracture in brittle deformation. The folding, just like any geologic folding that we've talked about before, happens at depth and the brittle fracturing happens at the surface. And when these fractures form at the surface, they're called crevices, as we can see in the picture. And to make the analogy of glaciers with rivers again, we can see that just like rivers, ice flows fastest at its center and at its top and slower at the bottom and at the edges of the glacier. And so now that we know a little bit about how glaciers tend to flow, what causes them to pick up sediment and deposit sediment and actually leave behind a record for us to tell that a glacier was once there? Well, there are two types of glaciers I want to mention before we move on. These are cold-based glaciers versus warm-based glaciers. Cold-based glaciers are very frozen and cold, dry glaciers that don't tend to move a lot, and if they do, they're kind of just deforming due to their own weight on top of their selves, and they don't really move except by creeping a little bit very slowly. However, warm-based glaciers are where at the base of the glacier, you're going to get some meltwater and lubrication that's going to add to the speed of that glacier, and it's going to flow faster, it's going to erode more, it's going to pick up more, and it's going to deposit more, etc. And so this is why I want to emphasize that meltwater is key. To have have movement, deformation, and deposition by a glacier, you need at least a little bit of meltwater. And so as we can see in this picture, glaciers can abrade pre-existing bedrock and pluck up fractured sediment pieces from that bedrock. And because at their base they're always melting and recrystallizing, they can incorporate these fragments into their glacial mass. And then like a conveyor belt, they're going to transport and deposit this sediment over time in front of them as a moraine, alongside of them as lateral moraines, and we'll talk about these landforms a little bit later as well. So there are three general modes of till production and deposition that we're going to talk about, and till is just sediment deposited directly by a glacier. So these three types of till production and deposition include melt-out till, which occurs when there is basal melt-out, so at the base of the glacier there is melt-out of interglacial sediment that it's carrying under stagnant conditions. So the glacier is not flowing at the moment, and that may be because it's flat in the area or other causes, but basically something causes the glacier to melt at its base and let out some sediment and deposit it right there where it is. And then there's lodgment till, which is basal meltout and lodgment of rigid substrate under flowing ice. So what happens is you have melting of the glacier base, and then you have meltout till deposit, and then you lodge that till into the pre-existing underlying sediment under the ice. And lastly, we have deformation till, which is basically just the deformation of pre-existing sediment that underlies a 
flowing glacier. And this can happen typically when you have non-bedrock pre-existing sediment. So basically loose sediment that a glacier starts to flow over will get deformed and this causes deformation till. And so to show an example of what deposited till might look like in an outcrop, we can look at this image to the left here. We have this outcrop full of till, super, super coarse boulders that have faceted edges and striations because of the glacial erosion and deformation. And this is contrasted with the outwash deposits in the picture on the right. Outwash deposits represent sediment carried out by meltwaters from a glacier. And these are smaller in size because the meltwater has to carry them, not the glacier. The glaciers can carry much larger boulders than any water could ever carry. And they're stream rounded. And so they look really rounded if you look at the cobbles at the lower parts of the images and compare the two. So now to get to landforms created by glaciers, we can see that in this image, we have what's called glacial troughs or U-shaped valleys that are carved by glaciers and very U-shaped and smooth. And then we have cirques, which look like this. And they're also formed by glaciers. This is typically where you'll have snow start to accumulate and glaciers form and they flow down that valley. And then once they melt completely, the cirque where there is a depression in the circular area will have this lake left in it. And then you have tarns and horns. And there's an example of a horn in this picture. Then you have arets as shown in the upper picture. These are all landforms created by glaciers in a mountainous area. But we're going to be really focusing on landforms created by glaciers as as they retreat as a larger glacial system, maybe like an ice sheet or something, because this is when the bulk of glacial terrestrial deposition occurs. The reason we're having a whole part two video over glacial marine processes is because that causes the bulk of glacial deposition that gets preserved, because marine settings are a lot more likely to not get eroded and to actually be preserved long enough for us to go find them and interpret them. So landforms and deposits by glaciers as they retreat in terrestrial settings are not super common, but when we see them, they're very distinctive and very helpful. So that's why we're going to focus on these. And if we look at this diagram here, the first thing we're going to talk about is kettle lakes and caves. As we see in this image, we have what's called cave and kettle topography. And this is basically a bunch of little depressions that were formed by the glacier as it was moving and eroding. And then these depressions are filled later as the glacier retreats with meltwater from the glacier. And these are kettles. And then we have caves, which are irregular mounds of sand, gravel, and till, which form also in depressions because as the glacier retreats, it starts to deposit all its sediment. Similar to caves are eskers, which are kind of like that in that there are a lot of sediment deposited as the glacier retreats. However, eskers are elongated structures where you have eskers actually stretching for over several kilometers, which which is insane. And like we saw in the diagram on the previous picture, eskers form parallel to the glacier's movement. So they're very different than moraines, which we'll get to in a couple slides. But before that, we have drumlin fields. And here's an image of a drumlin field in the middle and then how a drumlin forms in the bottom right. What drumlins are are just elongated hills shaped kind of like an upside down spoon. And they form because glacial ice can deform the underlying unconsolidated till. And what happens if you look at the picture on the bottom right, you have some irregularities or undulations in the pre-existing bedrock. And because of this, as the glacier flows over that, it's going to deposit till in an elongated fashion where it finds with the direction of flow. Not finding necessarily in grain size, but finding in the structure size. So it comes to a point with the direction of flow. Lastly, we'll talk about moraines. In this picture, you see an end moraine, but they can also be lateral, like I mentioned earlier. And what happens basically is just that the accumulation of till that had previously been carried by the glacier deposits in front of the glacier or on the sides of the glacier or in between two glaciers. But basically in this picture to the bottom left, we can see a lateral moraine forming at the side of the glacier and an end moraine in front of it. And end moraines are important because they mark the maximum reach 
or advance of the glacier before it begins retreating. So we'll talk a little bit shortly about some erosive glacial landforms before we get to stratigraphy. So here's an erosive glacial landform called a Roche Montagne, and this is shown in all three of these pictures and basically forms because of the process shown on the bottom left. We can see that bedrock is a braided upflow and plucked downflow, which causes a almost dune-like morphology feature, but is completely rocky. And so it's not like a dune at all in internal structure, but externally, it kind of looks the same way in that it points in the flow direction of the ice, and that sediment is moved from the upflow side, or in the case of a dune, the sta side, to the downflow side, or in the case of a dune, the lee side. Another important erosional feature caused by glaciers is the striation of bedrock due to glacier flow. And commonly this is associated with gouges as well. As we can see on the image on the right, the figure A, we have this beautiful smooth rock with beautiful striations and then these crazy gouges as well. And these gouges represent where maybe some meltout or lodgement till that was in the glacier deformed that bedrock. And so these kind of features are really indicative of glacial flow. And then you also have figure B showing crescent-like chatter marks, which are shown here by the arrow, and these record ice flow toward the camera, or in your case as you watch this, toward you. And both figure A and B are great features to keep in mind when you're wanting to look for glacial features without having to see anything deposited. Smoothly eroded rocks or gouged rocks or crescent marks in rocks are just as good as glacially deposited tills. The erosional features that glaciers form are just as helpful for understanding ancient environments. However, to get to stratigraphy, because I know that it's important for understanding timing of ancient environments to have an entire deposit to look at, we'll talk about stratigraphy of glacial deposits here in this slide. What we have in this strat column to the left is interglacial class and boulders deposited as meltout and lodgement tills, such as the gray and red class shown in the strat column. And then you have what's called deformation till, like we talked about pre-existing unconsolidated sediment that is deformed by glacier flowing over it. And this deformation till forms the thickest deposits of glacio-terrestrial sediment. And then what all the till rests on is pre-existing sediment that has been glacio-tectonized. And what glacio-tectonized means is just that tectonic and glacial processes were acting together to deform that pre-existing sediment. So what happens is that sediment will get compressed, folded, faulted, and fractured. And then after that, the glacier will then deposit all its till on top of the deformed sediment. So that is all I have for you guys today. I hope that was helpful for you in learning a little bit about glacio-terrestrial processes. And I hope that you come back to learn a little bit more about glacio-marine processes and deposition for the part two video, because glacio-marine processes have had so much more of a role into the geologic history of glaciers and ice ages as a whole, which we'll talk about ice ages through Earth's history in that video. And in the meantime, please feel free to click down below to watch the rest of the Depot System videos in the Depot System playlist. And thanks so much for watching. I'll see you guys next time. Bye!